Welcome and aloha. Uh, I am Mark Schlaw, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea to Australia to chat with Michael Butler. Michael is an attorney with the Finlayson's Law Firm, which is located in the city of Adelaide, which is the capital of the state of South Australia, which is in the middle of Australia. And I think we have a map to kind of get a, take a little look at, at where we are. And, and right at the, in the middle, South Australia in purple, and Adelaide down towards the bottom is, is where Michael is located. Michael and I became friends through our membership in the Inter-Pacific Bar Association. Uh, Michael is a tax attorney specialist, but his legal and practical knowledge and his activities for and on behalf of his clients are very broad and encompass a wide range of personal and professional skills that help his clients ultimately achieve their goals. So welcome, Michael. I, I, good to see you. I've asked you to tell us what's up down under. How are you? I'm well, Mark. It's a pleasure to be on your program. Okay. Now, so you want to, want to know what's happening in Australia? What's, what's happening, happening in Australia? What are the headlines in Adelaide today? Well, perhaps probably not surprisingly in Australia and Adelaide, uh, the headlines are just all about COVID. Uh, I tried to get you something different today, but it's, it's and I'll tell you why in, in just a moment, it's a big day today. But I suspect the, the emphasis is very different to Hawaii. I thought it might just be worth starting by uh, giving some context and comparing uh, your state with South Australia. Um, the populations are very similar. Hawaii is about 1.7, 1.5 million residents. South Australia has 1.7. Uh, but the, your current COVID daily cases are about 200, 220 or so, I, uh, so I understand. Ours are currently zero. Um, uh, the, the, the total cases to date of COVID in the last 80 months, Hawaii, my Wikipedia is telling me 87,000. Australia, South Australia, just over 900, substantially less. And in terms, unfortunately, of deaths in Hawaii, just over 1,000. In Australia, South Australia, four. Um, that may all change very, very soon. From midnight uh, last night, it's 9.30 here in the morning in Adelaide, so nine hours ago, South Australia has reopened its borders with the other states to double vaccinated travellers. And the news this morning is that there are 30,000 people waiting to cross the straight state line back into South Australia. So that's, that's a very real development this morning. And what we're doing, uh, we, we're, we're um, on the verge of achieving a double vaccination rate of just under 80%, but we're bracing ourselves to live with COVID. And I think that now that the, the border is open nine and a half hours ago, um, there's, there's, an, there's an acceptance that the daily COVID numbers are going to increase substantially. Still, what you've just told me is remarkable. I mean, we in Hawaii, believe that we have done a, a, a pretty good job with COVID. And uh, what you've told me says that South Australia, I mean, has-, has and, and Australia. Has really well. Well. Australia. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, how, how, I mean, how specifically has, well, your law firm, Finlayson's, and at your city, Adelaide, uh, South Australia, and all of Australia, how, how have you dealt with it to come up with these figures? Well, I think Australia's success in containing COVID can be traced to the decisions taken in March last year, so 18, 19 months ago. Firstly, to shut the Australian border to foreigners, it's xenophobic, but only allowing a limited number of returning Aussie citizens and permanent residents back into Australia. There's still a lot of Australians who want to come back. And secondly, preventing Australians leaving Australia. It's, it's a very a very hard border. There are exceptions, but the the border the, the border shutdown has meant that Australians simply haven't been able to travel overseas. And Mark Evans, you you know we Australians we love to travel, um, but it's had some very significant economic effects, and two vital industries have been very badly affected, um, like like why tourism, and also international uh, education with foreign students. I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit more in just a moment. 
Right. I mean, uh, and, you know, with respect to the practice of law, how has that changed for Australians and in your, in your personal practice and just generally? Uh, what, what, what is that like? It, it, it depends from state to state to state and state to territory. In uh, New South Wales and Victoria, our two our most populated states, the majority of lawyers have been working from home for almost 18 months. My, my daughter works in Sydney and she has a, her, her apartment is down near the sea. She's loving it. But um, in South Australia, apart from six to eight weeks in April, May last year, and a very snap three-day lockdown, hard lockdown last November, about a year ago, which was sparked by an outbreak at the, the Woodville Pizza Bar, uh, we've been back in the office uh, since, uh, since June, uh, early June 2020 for, for 17 months. Wow. Um, I mean, you seem to be in your office, Mark, but we, we've, we actually moved offices after 30 years on D-Day during the sixth last year. Um, we came back slowly, but we're, 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 we're um, uh, things may, but things may change very quickly, and very rapidly when we're ready for that. And our direction every day from our managing partners, make sure you take your, your surfaces home tonight when you go home. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's, things, I mean, it's really interesting. Very quickly. You know, and, and now you're looking towards this opening of the borders, which I guess everybody's holding their breath about. Um, and, and you mentioned there, there's some rules what, and, and some COVID mandates that must be followed. And tell us a little bit more. How did, and how do Australians, I mean, my, I, know, I know some Australians and I'm not sure how they would react to mandates, but how do they react to mandates and vaccinations and masks? Well, Australia, like the United States, is a federation of, of states and territories of an overarching federal government. And each state and territory, as I understand in the United States, is responsible for its own COVID manda mandates and restrictions. And one of the difficulties over the last 18 months has been that the often very different requirements in each of those states and territories. Some are open only to some states, others are open to, to all. In some states, masks are mandatory, uh, whereas in South Australia, for example, um, masks are compulsory indoors, but only in public areas. So that there, are, there are lots of differences. Interestingly, in Western Australia, which is geographically very distant from the rest of Australia, and Mark, you, you've seen that on your, your visual aid, um, they've been very successfully avoiding any COVID outbreaks by simply shutting their borders to everyone including Australia, period. Um, and that hard lockdown has been politically very popular and it seems to have done the trick. Um, as regards uh, man, uh, vaccinations, Australia has very quickly achieved uh, one of the highest vaccination rates in the, in the world. Uh, we started a bit late because we had to get our supplies and, and, and the other uh, uh, Europe and uh, North America obviously needed to get vaccinated first. But the majority of Australians have been seizing the opportunity uh, to protect themselves. And indeed, the, the, the governments are linking, uh, the Australian state and federal governments are linking vaccination rates to the reopening of the borders. Uh, to be sure, there are a number of very vocal and ardent anti-vaxxers. And only last week, there were freedom rallies and, and large freedom rallies in all of the states and territories. However, unless individuals are double vaccinated, they are becoming increasingly marginalized and excluded from pubs, restaurants, sporting events, concerts, movies, and the like. Um, one other difficult issue that's arising in relation to vaccination is whether employers and employers and uh, workplaces can insist that in individuals be uh, double vaccinated as a matter of law. Um, a number of, of, of companies and government departments, and I think in the same way as the United States, there are a lot of similarities, I think, Mark, have taken the, the, the view or the position that employees must be double vaccinated in order to keep working. And that's especially the case in the, the health and aged care sectors with the police and fire. Um, however, there are a number of outstanding and unresolved issues and very much untested workplace issues about whether 
uh, employers can, infor can in fact force their employees to be vaccinated if they want to continue working. And, and is there litigation about that? Is there lawsuits or? Uh, here. Uh, Australia's one of Australia's richest, richest men, the, the mining magnate, uh, magnate Clive Palmer, who is, is based in Queensland, uh, 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 mounted a, a, a court, a, um, a, an appeal to our high court, which is the equivalent of your Supreme Court, about his inability to access Western Australia. Uh, but that went down in flames. Uh, the government, we, we have free trade, commerce, and intercourse between states under our constitution, just like the United States. But uh, and the, and trade and commerce must be absolutely free, but uh, the, it has to be proportionate. And it was held that the, the, the laws regulating travel were were, were proportionate. Now, and and you know, I, I, I'm just amazed by the how well you folks have done. And I, I understand you're holding your breath and to see what happens next. Has the government uh, of Australia done anything? Uh, uh, well, how have you been affected economically? I mean, has, has that uh, been affected by the COVID pandemic? And, and if so, what's the government done? Well, I think as a general, um, some, some businesses have suffered very badly, particularly in, in the larger states, uh, New South Wales and Victoria. Victoria had, some, had 260 days of lockdowns and six lockdowns over the last 18 months. Um, but the, the Australian common, economy very generally has been fairly resilient. Uh, very early in April last year, the federal government introduced its so-called JobKeeper program, which heavily subsidised the wages of employees where provided the business could show or could predict that it uh, would have a 30% decline in revenue. And that was to enable firms to retain employees, to hibernate, and to be ready to emerge at the other side. And that appears to have been very successful. But what unfortunately has happened is that it appears that a large number of firms claimed JobKeeper and very large firms claimed many, many millions of JobKeeper, where not only didn't their revenues decrease over the JobKeeper uh, reference period, but their revenues actually increased and they made very, very substantial profits. And there have recently been calls for companies that claim JobKeeper to disclose their revenues and profitability over the relevant period. At present, the government um, uh, seems to have the view that as JobKeeper work, let's just move on. Um, I have, I, I don't think we've seen the end of this, the last of this particular, uh, this issue. You know, and, and one, one quick question I wanna ask you about, about the travel thing that, that you were talking about in, the borders reopening in in, in West in uh, South Australia, but um, if I'm a, if I'm in Hawaii and I want to go to Australia, can I go to Australia? What, what, is there a problem at, with that? At the now? moment, when, the, when will that happen? The international borders are just opening, uh, but and it was announced yesterday. Mark, this is an, I'm not surprised. Given my admiration for you professionally, but um, the you, you've, the, the South Australian or the, the South Australian borders open today, uh, the, and the government announced only yesterday the fe the federal government that uh, they will be fast tracking uh, the increase in, in the migrant intake and, and and visas to come back to Australia, but in particular targeting the international student sector and skilled migrants to cover the, sk the skills gaps. We, we rely to a, gr a great extent on um, travelers and people on working holidays. And that just hasn't happened over the last 18 months. If you want to tell me, you'd be an essential traveler, Mark. If you know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there, there are, um, the, the other issues is, one issue is getting a visa. The other one is the quarantine. And up until very recently, to the extent that even if you're Australian, you could come back, you had to quarantine in one of the quarantine hotels in the main capital cities for two weeks, no ifs, no buts. Um, and there have been some minor exceptions, but it's, it's, that's going to be the issue. In terms of opening up, um, I think the current intention is if you are double vaccinated from overseas and you can get a visa, you can effectively home vaccinate for seven days. I think that's, the, the, that's where they're moving to. Will that work? It remains to be seen. Watch this space. 
Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I, I would imagine that a lot of people are very interested in Australia if they know these facts. And it sounds like Australia actually welcomes people from other countries into its country, uh, and which is somewhat different than the United States in some ways. Uh, and it, I, I, it sounds like it benefits Australia. Uh, I, 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 wanna, I wanna move on. I wanna ask a question about the Australia, France, US nuclear submarine controversy. And I wanna, I mean, that, that was in the news. Uh, there was a lot of um, problems between France and the United States in the news, but I, we never really heard the Australian viewpoint. And I'd like to ask you, what, what was that controversy, the, uh, you know, with the, the submarines, the nuclear submarines? What was that from the Australian point of view? And what's been the reaction to this change in, uh, of where we're getting our submarines from? Mr. Schlob, I'm a tax lawyer from South Australia. This is above my pay scale, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Look, for what it's worth, uh, my understanding is that Australia, and this is public, cancelled the, pub, the French submarine contract for a variety of reasons. But on the basis, the costs have blown out significantly. There was already substantial delays. And Australia was only getting diesel and not nuclear subs, and only in about 20 years time. And so there are a variety of problems. And it's also been reported that the French were aware that the subcontract was in trouble well before the announcement of the AUKUS pact. Um, and it, it certainly caused an enormous amount of publicity at the same time. And we, perhaps the interesting point, Mark, is that we were actually, I think, aware in Australia a lot more about what was going on overseas. And we were aware of the issues that, uh, that your president was having with, with Macron. And we are aware of those issues that France was having in the United States. And um, uh, we, we, we watched them closely. But the interesting thing is that, um, uh, was it three or four weeks on, um, things have moved on. It's, it's no longer newsworthy. It's a 20, it's a 24 hour news cycle. COVID, COVID, COVID. We've moved on, I think, from the submarines. Well, I, you know, and, and I just want one, one more thing about the kind of connected with the submarines. What's the relationship with China uh, and Australia? What, how is that? And, and is there is there business going on now? And is there cordial cordiality? And I know that a lot of students come from China to Australia. Uh, What's Australia, going on? Australia enjoyed a very close relationship, uh, trade and economic and cultural with China before COVID. Unfortunately, as a result of the Australian uh, calling for an international investigation into the origins of COVID, our Prime yeah. Minister did this some time ago, uh, China has imposed a, a number of import bans and very high tariffs that have affected a number of Australian industries in particular barley, cotton, uh, wine and seafood, uh, a number mm -hmm. of the favorites. However, Australia continues to export iron ore to China, although there are fears that falling spear, uh, steel prices and weaker demand may affect that important trade sector. Uh, but nevertheless, we've, I think, continued to see a significant amount of business continue to be carried on in Australia uh, by Chinese investors. We're aware of that. As regards Chinese students, I mentioned a moment ago that the international education center sector had been hit very hard by the border closures, and that's in all states and territories. However, there's a very strong uh, push to encourage foreign students to return. And it'll be interesting to see whether the numbers bounce back, especially given the announcement only yesterday that uh, for the re-entry of students and skilled migrants will in fact be prioritized. And there's been a, a lot of work going on in the background there. And I think we'll, uh, in South Australia, uh, very much we have a, we, we, we consider it very important, but I know also in Victoria and, and New South Wales, they're all very keen for students to come back. Okay, so that, that looks hopeful uh, for the future based on what you've told me uh, and the, the relationship is an interesting one uh, under these strange times. Everything seems COVID related. Um, I, I wanna uh, put up Finlayson's website uh, on the screen. Uh, and the, the Finlayson's website uh, opens with the words, industry focused, 
globally minded, relationship driven. I, I, and I, I know you're, you're, you're marketing your, your law firm, but those are kind of important words. And what, what, what do they mean to you and your law firm? And what do they have to do with the practice of law? A lot of questions there, right? I'll go through them. Um, the reference to industry focused is the fact that we've, for many, many years, specialized in a number of industries rather than specific areas of law. We've, we've focused on the, the industries, uh, such as agribusiness and food, uh, defense, education, energy, environmental, family business, health and aged care, uh, property development, and as we'll discuss in just a moment, I hope, uh, the wine industry. Um, so that's industry focus as regards globally minded. Although we're based in Adelaide with an office in Darwin, which is due north on your map, Mark, right at the top, we act for a number of clients outside Australia and for Australian clients who are seeking to invest and do business overseas. I recently did a tally and over the last few years, I think we've assisted clients with their legal matters in over 30 foreign countries. And that certainly keeps me interested in coming to work every morning. Um, finally, the, the, the relationship driven um, is, is, is the fact that we strive to have long-term relationships with our clients and their businesses over the years, uh, rather than having one transaction stands. Um, <laughs> so I, I think those three points, are, um, it's, it's not just marketing, uh, not just marketing, Mark, we, we, we live it and breathe it. Well, and yeah, and you mentioned the wine. The Finlayson's website indicates that you have legal expertise in the wine industry. Now, what is a tax lawyer doing in the wine industry? What, what's that about? Um, well, when, when our, our clients and friends and family hear that we have a dedicated wine law group, their first response is, hey, Mike, we all like drinking wine, but what's the legal angle? <laughs> And I like them to introduce. I like them to introduce them to my wine law partner, Will Taylor, who's been practicing solely in this area for 25 years. Um, our wine group deals with a wide range of, of wine law issues, um, but in particular in relation to wine taxation, as you've got me on, on my my, my favourite topic. Um, when the Australian uh, sales tax system was revamped in the late 1990s. We had five different rates, depending on what type of category of good or goods you were selling. It was replaced with a, a uniform 10% goods and services tax. And what the government had to do at that stage was to introduce a wine equalization tax of 29%. And that replaced the 42% wholesale sales tax that was imposed on wine. So the 29% wine equalization tax plus the 10% GST was about the same as a 42% wholesale tax on wholesale prices. The math is a, math is a bit wonky there, but it does work. Um, then in the early 2000s, the government introduced the wine producer rebate. And what that does is it passes back the 29% uh, wine equalization tax, the wet, the producers uh, the, and collect on behalf of the government passes it back to the producers and that's designed to encourage and support regional winemakers and diversity in winemaking product and our, our wine the finnison's wine, uh, wine tax group advises wine manufacturers on their ability to claim this very important tax rebate um, if i can finish off on the spiel mark we're actually very deeply committed to the wine industry and every year for the last 27 years We've delivered the Finlayson's Wine Roadshow, where we go to typically nine or 10 winemaking regions right around Australia, not just in South Australia, although we do make the best wine in South Australia. We do that on, and, and we speak on a variety of legal, regulatory, tax, accounting, and marketing issues. You know, I, I think I would like to go along with that uh, tour and uh, talk about this more over a glass of wine, perhaps. I've done it a couple of times, it's hard work. <laughs>
Um, now, we're, we're getting towards the end of our program, and I, I want to ask a couple questions about uh, how we go forward. And, you know, how can Australia and the United States, and, and especially Hawaii, uh, and I know you've done some work with some, some Hawaii folks, but how, how can we work together for the, for the mutual benefit of, 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 of both countries, both states, South Australia, Hawaii? What, what can we do? I, I did check my figures here just to be sure of, of a fact I'm just going to, to put forward. Um, the US has for many, many years and continues to be the largest source of foreign direct investment into Australia. Oh, As you, you, we're, we're a capital importing country, we import capital and we import people. Um, and I think, and, and uh, I think Mark, you and I, through our mutual love of the Inter-Pacific Bar Association, we know that international trade is, is the lifeblood of the world economy. And once the pandemic is over, and it will end, maybe not this year and maybe not next year, but when it does end, and businesswomen and businessmen are able to travel again, and with the skills they've learned from uh, re working remotely, over the last 18 months, I believe that Australia and the United States in particular, and especially Hawaii, will be able to work very closely for their mutual benefit. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago that I've recently been assisting a Hawaiian client who's keen to import goods from Australia into the Hawaiian market. And what they realised through their research was that there was an opening in the Hawaiian market for certain Australian products. And I'm very much hoping that that's a, a sign of things to come. Um, and also by Aussies uh, traveling to, to your lovely state and to importing your goods and services. And as I think I, I, I mentioned to you earlier on, Mark, um, we were all raised watching Gilligan's Island. And so we certainly feel as, we have, as if we have a, a great affinity uh, for the, the Hawaiian state. Okay, well, that, that's uh, <laughs> good to hear. And a lot of what you're talking about also is a lot of relationships. Uh, now, we have, we have one minute left. And I, I just wanna, wanna ask you, what, what have you learned about life and the practice of law uh, during these strange times? I, I, when I, when I thought about that, I had an immediate answer. And it, it's legally based, but you know, there's an enormous amount of information out there on the internet, Mark. Every man can be his own physician. Everybody can be his own lawyer. But at the end of the day, there's no substitute for sitting down with an independent lawyer to discuss your professional business and personal tax and legal problems. And I think um, that's, that's, of course, legally focused, but I think that goes to, to, to all areas of life that... Uh, we're really going to be the importance of personal relationships in doing business. It, it, it can't be done entirely over the internet, even by Zoom. <laughs> you know, I, I agree. Getting together, especially as we, we, you and I got together at the Inter-Pacific Bar Association, that type of relationship, uh, that's how it, it started and grew. So, uh, my, Michael Butler, I, I appreciate you being my guest today. Thank you very much. Uh, look forward to the next time we are seeing each other in person, uh, hopefully over a glass of wine. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, and aloha. Aloha. <laughs>